Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report, and we have the uh, remarkable analysis of Joel Skousen on World Affairs Brief. Uh, Joel, how can they get a, obtain a copy of your newsletter, and uh, what's the procedure? Well, the World Affairs Brief is showcased on my website, worldaffairsbrief.com, and there is a modest subscription price for my weekly newsletter. It comes out every Friday. But people can get a free sample issue by emailing me at editor at worldaffairsbrief.com. And I highly recommend it. I think this is my first and most important newsletter I read every week. There's a lot that are what I call take extreme points of view that are not based on all the facts, or they don't look at the history of the situation or the full dynamics of what's going on. But I think repeatedly you've proven that your reports are read up there uh, in many areas uh, more predictive than even Gerald Salente in terms of what's going on. Well, and, uh, you know, Gerald has got a good track record in the past, but recently, ever since 2012, when he predicted the collapse of the euro, the collapse of the dollar, and the collapse of everything, and was completely wrong, a lot of his credibility has been damaged. And that's the problem with analyzing things, you know, from a fundamentals point of view. Sure, the, the financial situation is an absolute mess. We've got pure fiat money. But, you know, you've got to realize, and that's one of the problems, the difference between myself and Gerald. Gerald Salini or other analysts out there, is that I understand what this globalist conspiracy is all about, how much power they have, and how much power they have to continue to keep things afloat longer than people think who, who base their things on fundamentals. Exactly. And so In other words, it transcends what, you, what looks obvious on the surface, that they control all aspects of the game, and you're one of the few that actually looks at that, including things like what's going on in the Middle East, what's happening in international finance. And what's likely to happen in the long run over the next 10 years with Russia and China's attempt and plans to invade and take over America. Well, that's right. And uh, I'm one of the few analysts in the United States besides yourself who believes that Russia and China are preparing for a nuclear preemptive strike on the West. And my analysis, though, indicates that our own government is covering for Russia and China. They want this strike. They want this war. It's going to be able to drive the American people, and it's the only thing that will drive them into a militarized new world order where they lose essential freedoms and sovereignty. If we think 9-11 was bad about loss of liberties, you wait till the mother of all terrorism, the nuclear strike on America comes, and our leaders come out of their bunkers and say they didn't know, just like in 9-11, but this is very yeah. much a planned uh, you know, uh, thing. And, and the Middle East has a lot to do with that, though I do not believe that the Middle East, as bad as it is, will actually end up in, in Third World War. For example, uh, this week in Syria, uh, Israel, or last week Israel made several attacks, uh, direct military attacks on Syrian targets. Syria did not retaliate, and it looked as if uh, Syria or Israel was really trying to um, do the bidding of the, of the West to do active military engagements against the Syrian army. And yet, Russia entered the fray this this week, then saying, "Don't do it again, Israel, or there will be consequences." Now, a lot of people have been saying that uh, Russia, this is going to be a line in the sand for Russia. They're not going to let Syria fall, and I don't believe it. I do think that just as uh, Russia lets uh, Iraq fall, and they were the main supplier, they were the main uh, weapons and military ally of Iraq, and they let it fall. Uh, they show no signs of defending Iran. Uh, they uh, have been more uh, rhetorical in their defense of Syria. But just today, they're getting together with the United States and talking about a peace talks in June and about, you know, the preconditions of those things. Uh, so I think, in, in my analysis, based upon the long historical pattern, that Russia has had of not going to the war uh, to war with the West until it's ready. And the Middle East isn't the time yet. It's too early, in my opinion, for Russia and China to attack the West. They aren't prepared yet. They have uh, they fake their own demise in the so-called fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and you know, insiders who really know what's going on in Russia understand that. Uh, and so does the West as well. They actually covered for that phony fall. There were so many things that were phony about the the so-called Gorbachev coup and the fact that the KGB could not arrest him. Uh, I'm almost looking impotent. Yeah, it looks really, it's ridiculous, isn't it? 
It really is. But the main yeah. point is that Russia and China are, are using uh, China, for example, its uh, detente with the West, its uh, economic, uh, becoming an economic power because of trade with the West and, and shipping all of that technology over to China. And they've still got a ways to go. They're, they're building a blue water navy, navy in earnest and is still eight to ten years away from being complete, oh. where they yeah. can occupy Japan down through Australia, which they fully intend to during the next war. And, uh, you know, and Russia itself, even though it's further ahead in terms of advanced weaponry, once again through stealing from the uh, from the West, notably the United States uh, technology, uh, they still aren't, still aren't ready yet. Uh, they're in the process of a major building program militarily. Uh, the West gives an annual report on China and its military threat situation, which they downplay, but it doesn't give any report to Congress at all about the Russian threat, which is way ahead of the Chinese threat so far. And that's always been a, a harbinger for me of the, the concept that they're covering for the Russians and Chinese and not warning the American people that this is the big threat. Meanwhile, we continue to rampage through the world, um, uh, making enemies, especially among the Muslim world, and that's what uh, a lot of this intervention is, is all about. Sure, there is the control of oil. There is the tactic, especially in the Arab Spring, of cutting off China's access to all of the oil in the African countries, which they were involved in developing when they attacked, when the West attacked Libya. There were 30,000 Chinese oil workers that had to leave Libya, and that was done on purpose, just as the United States uh, cut off oil supplies to Japan in the British-controlled uh, uh, Malaysia Empire in order to provoke Japan into attacking World, uh, Pearl Harbor. And in the same sense, I believe that the globalists are provoking uh, China and um, uh, Russia through the anti-missile system, which, by the way, you know, is aimed at um, Russian missiles in the boost phase. It's not aimed, uh, or they're not aimed towards Iran or terrorism. Otherwise, they would be, you know, located much closer to Iran. Uh, and the Russians know that, and the Russians know that the ABM system is not offensive weapons. They are purely defensive. In fact, they don't even have a warhead. So they can yeah. never be offensive weapons, as the Russians mm -hmm. claim, and the Russians know that. But they know that they are a major threat to their nuclear first strike potential, and that's why the Russians are so worried about it. Uh, and uh, why the U.S. is kind of both covering for the Russians' war preparation and irritating them at the same time. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's a double game, isn't it? Uh, including John Kerry's it, it, behavior, which doesn't make sense. It's like, why would you even have a dialogue about these which are non-offensive weapons? That's right. And you see, Americans don't understand that. Well, if you're right, Joel, about the Russians or the Americans covering for the Russians, then why are they irritating the Russians? Well, it's that they have to do two things at one time. They yeah, want to provoke the them to war, but they want to make sure the American people aren't alerted to the fact that a war is coming. They want it to be a surprise. They want Americans unprepared. The United States government is building huge uh, nuclear bunkers, you know, half a mile underground, and that isn't because of some terrorist attack. That's because no. they know a nuclear strike is coming, and they want to survive it, but they aren't warning the American people about it. But as I have been saying, uh, the, the Iranian war, the Middle East war that will come about because of the Israeli attack on the Iranians is too soon for the Russians. That's why this will not turn into World War III. That's why Russia will not go to the mat against the United States and Israel over Syria. Now, the attack on Syria is very much a part of the future attack on Iran. The Americans and Israelis both know that if, when they attack Iran, that Iran will retaliate, not only against Israel, but against American troops in the area. And I think part of the reason why they were put into the area in both Iraq and Afghanistan is to be there, to be bloodied, so that the U.S. will have an excuse to come in and annihilate Iran when Israel attacks it. Exactly. Amazing. back and uh, Joel if you want to continue your analysis of the Middle Eastern situation there's a lot of disinformation in the news and you know, what I call obviously wrong spin being put by the regular media and the alternative on what's happening a lot of statements that just uh, 
<laughs> you actually cut the pieces very nicely in your newsletter. It's uh, quite remarkable. Well, thank you. The uh, The main problem is that the news media repeats the propaganda put out by Israel that the excuse for their attacks was they were stopping armed shipments to Hezbollah, particularly anti-aircraft batteries moving into Lebanon. Well, those batteries have long been situated near the border. Because they were near the border doesn't mean they were headed for Lebanon. Um, they don't, uh, you know, look, Hezbollah is a guerrilla force, not an open military, able to host such a juicy target within its borders. The attack, of course, does make a convenient excuse for Israel to attack Syria, but it's really a cover for the fact that Syria's mobile anti-aircraft batteries are also a threat to any Western military intervention into Syria from the Mediterranean. These kinds of batteries must be taken down before U.S. or EU politicians would dare commit aircraft to these kinds of direct... Uh, you know, aerial assaults, or even, you know, to enforce a phony no-fly zone. You know, it's never a no-fly zone. It's much more than that. But that appears to be a harmless, uh, neutral way of intervening when, in fact, we know that in the Libyan no-fly zone that we had B-2 bomber runs making bombing runs during the so-called no-fly zone. So it was hardly a non-interventionist strategy. Of course, there was the military strike on Syria's Jamraya Military Research Center. It's actually a missile assembly plant. And uh, once again, there's no way to tell anything where anything is shipping inside a missile uh, assembly plant. And as one of the uh, Israeli writers wrote, who's in opposition to the Netanyahu government, he said, for Israelis politicians, there is a broader strategic goal. We can tell this because... The confirmation about the airstrikes was so public, with officials giving background details within hours rather than hiding from the spotlight, as they did when a similar raid went off in January. You know, the uh, Israelis almost never confirm or broadcast any details about when they attack Syria, unless they want to get, uh, you know, Syrians or Israelis used to the fact that they're entering a much more uh, hostile phase. Of course, the U.S. continues to claim that they are only giving non-lethal aid to the Syrian jihadists. But, uh, of course, they have many surrogates in Qatar and uh, Libya to funnel a never-ending supply of arms to the Syrian opposition via black market channels. Uh, but apparently, you know, all of this aid has not been sufficient to get the job done, and I think that's because, you know, the Hadis just aren't a very good military structure. The, and the Syrian regime is uh, Soviet-trained, uh, proving to be a very tough nut to crack. Of course, the latest propaganda from the Syrian rebel leaders is that they're begging more arms, direct arming from the West, and promising not to share arms with extremists, if that were possible. Realistically, yeah, like there's me. no set of uniforms that tell who are the good guys or the bad guys. Uh, the West has cobbled together a coalition and claimed it to be a unified, but it's anything but unified. And all of these actors in the Middle East conflicts are some shade of bad, ultimately competing with one another. The end result is there are going to be more revolution from this and warfare, just like in Libya, not to mention a horrific purge when they finally do gain control in Syria. Yeah, a purge of uh, anybody Jewish or Christian, a purge of different sects of Islam that they don't agree with. And a purge of all the Alawite uh, tribe that's related to the Assad regime. And even exactly. though the Assad regime uh, is uh, named mostly Alawites uh, to various uh, bureaucratic and high positions in the, in the military, nevertheless, as unjust as that is in discrimination, it doesn't justify the, the, the wholesale killing of people which will occur when the opposition takes power. And, of course, the U.S. has never been able to make anything of their red lines against chemical weapons in, uh, in Syria, even though there's been these claims that uh, chemical weapons have been used. Uh, the Syrians have said, look, you know, the rebels took over some of our depots. They've got the weapons. They're the ones who are using them. We can prove it. Send in the U.S. inspectors, and we'll prove it. And even the U.S. has not been able to get the U.N. to disprove that because it can't be disproven. And, of course, now there was a defection last uh, week of a Russian-made MiG-21 that landed in a Jordanian military base. It seemed to be equipped for uh, chemi to carry chemical warfare materials, but that's still not a smoking gun. Just equipping an aircraft with chemical weapons is not the same as using chemical weapons. And the defecting aircraft had no chemicals aboard. Well, of course, Israel is... Uh, uh, the Western governments are continuing to... Um, 
make or, or to ruin morale in the Syrian military by cutting off all internet and cell phone access to the country. Making a country go dark is also a way to try to get the people to lose faith in the Assad regime. It's been done many, many other times before. I remember when the establishment made an excuse for why the communists won in China, and they said, well, the, the, the troops of Chiang Kai-shek were demoralized. Well, why were they demoralized? They never said that. It's because George Catlin Marshall had cut off all military aid to them, and they knew where they were going to lose it. That would be extremely demoralizing. Sure, there's going to be plenty of defections once you get that kind of uh, a Western attack against a pro-Western government. Now, Syria has not been particularly pro-Western, although the United States has done a lot of black deals with Syria. They used to send, uh, uh, you know, a special rendition of patients down to Syria to be tortured, and so they've worked with the West just like the West worked with Gaddafi, who was no saint as well. Exactly. But now, how this transitions the, over... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please continue. Well, ultimately, this is all going to be used to to continue to justify a war on Iran. And so uh, Washington yes. last week authorized the leak of details of his new bunker-busting bombs that can drill deep into the mountains that hide Iran's uranium-enriching centrifuges. And, uh, you know, this is all being leaked to the public just to prepare them for the fact. The problem is there's a Reuters uh, and, and other polls out there saying the American people really don't want to get involved in any more of these foreign wars. There's only a, you know, less than a 30% uh, uh, of the people who want to go in and attack Syria. It's not high enough, um, you know, to do anything. And even General Ray Odierno, the uh, Army Chief of Staff, says, but, you know, if the U.S. is going to intervene in Syria, it's going to have to be within the next month or two, because with the uh, uh, sequester uh, budget cuts in effect, he says, we're really losing capability in the military and just not going to have enough money to run what we've got, let alone any additional wars of intervention. Now, I actually disagree with Odierno. He doesn't know that he's facing a situation where globalists, when they put a target on somebody, they won't take no for an answer. I don't care if they have to spend money they don't have. They will take Syria down because Syria is the primary threat against Israel should Israel attack Iran. If Syria being ally has the most missiles that are the closest to Israel that can really put Israel in a hurt locker relative to civilian casualties. And the aero system, the other uh, Iron Dome missile defense systems that Israel has are only sufficient to protect military targets, if that, certainly not civilian targets, and that would be very unpopular with people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's a fantastic analysis. When we come back, maybe we can touch on Benghazi, and much more that you right. dealt with in the last newsletter and what's coming up in the Friday newsletter. You want to go to worldaffairsbrief.com and get that newsletter. It's that important. Read it every week. Back in a moment. And um, Joel, let's hear your analysis of Benghazi, um, and uh, and of course your newsletters uh, last week and coming up this week. What are the highlights? Well, you know, no discussion of Syria would be complete without the connection to the Benghazi attack. It, there was a U.S. ambassador killed and several persons trying to save his life. We now find out there were some 30-odd survivors of the Benghazi attack, which Congress quickly spirited away to uh, a hospital, uh, Army uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and kept them incommunicado which meant that they weren't allowed to talk or call anybody or tell where they were. They didn't want the press or the or anyone in Congress finding out that there were survivors as they went through these uh, congressional hearings. But basically there are two crucial aspects that um, – are as impeachment-worthy as anything in Iran-Contra. One, the Benghazi ambassador and embassy were involved in coordinating arms trade with Libya to Syrian, uh, from Libya to Syrian rebels and jihadists, all proclaimed enemies of the United States. 
Of course, throughout the Syrian conflict, the U.S. has denied doing anything like this, and that's why the operation had to be kept a secret. The secrecy was blown when competing jihadist groups in Libya moved in to take the weapons for their own use, and that's what the battle was all about. Of course, everything in the hearings and everything out of the State Department was a massive disinformation. In the first place, uh, um, U.N. Ambassador uh, Susan Rice claimed that this was in reaction to some uh, shadowy, um, sloppy video produced that was anti-Muslim produced in the United States and critical of Muslims. Hillary Clinton uh, repeated that, and it was simply absolutely untrue. Greg Hicks, who appeared before the commission, or the Congressional Commission, to testify, said there was no demonstration at all. This was an attack from the very beginning. And uh, in other words, to say that this was a demonstration against a video that turned uh, vile, it was just absolutely untrue. Um, anyway, there was all, the major uh, problem with the entire scenario is the fact that the Congress is not investigating the stand-down. Even though Hicks, Greg Hicks, uh, who was a deputy uh, State Department Operations Center uh, in charge of the operations center, he was there and knew everything about what was going on during the attack. He testified that uh, he immediately started a call for reinforcements, talked to the defense attache. He said, uh, you know, planes could arrive within two to three hours from Aviano Air Base in Italy. And uh, even if one flew over Benghazi and they had a C-130 available uh, in Libya itself, which could have flown over and it caused them to scatter. But he said permission was never given in Libya for any uh, airplane to take off and head towards uh, Benghazi. There was clearly no intention to provide air support. Now, the big uh, uh, testimony that was very important was U.S. Ambassador persuaded, well, was that um, uh, this C-130 that was available in Libya with a colonel and special forces was Lieutenant uh, Colonel Gibson, who was about to go to the airport in Tripoli where they were manned, to, and was ordered to stand down and do not go to Benghazi. The orders came from AFRICOM, that's the African Command, U.S. Command, in charge was General Ham. Hicks did not know, he said, who communicated the orders to Gibson, but it wasn't Ham. In other words, General Ham, uh, the commander of AFRICOM, was in fact relieved of his command because he refused to obey the stand-down order. That means someone else called Gibson with the stand-down order, and interestingly enough, neither General Ham nor Gibson were called to testify before the committee. Both of them would have had first-hand knowledge of who in the White House told them to stand down. So you see, with all this hubbub about the lack of security at the embassy as the only issue, the much larger issue is being obscured and omitted. Yeah, in other words, although there's a dance there, the dance is, to, is in a sense another cover-up. That's right. It is a cover-up, and uh, you know, it's... So, so even Darrell Ice's initial committee should have had these other individuals in the, in the hearing it would have made it evident there there would right, when right to the top not only the Secretary of State but Obama's administration, specifically redacting information and twisting it, and also putting out basically withdrawing security forces. It's almost like a mafia hit on this ambassador, so he must have crossed the wrong person. Well, I'm not so sure he crossed because he was, in fact, engaged in shipping arms to Syria. This was a top-secret operation. I think that what they didn't expect was this actual attack and trying to get control by another group, competing group, to whom they were sending weapons to, to try to get control of these weapons. And uh, the entire secret operation was now blown open, and I think the powers that be decided we better make sure that everybody's dead there so that nobody can talk about what we were doing. And right, in other words, I, they uh, basically thought he wasn't, in other words, uh, the ambassador was not a player, so we might as well tie up loose ends is what you're saying. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, another story in last week's brief is about China. I spent significant time on China's uh, continues their aggressive maneuvers despite the U.S. concessions. Um, of course, uh, you know, the, the annual Pentagon report on the Chinese military situation came out this year. And as opposed to last year, you know, they did a, a truncated 48-page report, which basically said nothing in detail. And it was meant to simply cover for the Chinese 
a pleasure to give a um, you know a uh, a very small synopsis or snapshot and downplaying the influence. But this time, because Congress was really upset about that truncated report last time, they decided to give the full report, and it was a whopper. They had uh, you know the. Uh, decisions in in the report about uh, you know new missiles being developed about new aircraft carriers being developed the new stealth fighters all of these things are uh, being very very uh, uh, you know showcased very very obviously China's building two new classes of missile submarines in addition to eight nuclear submarines and six attack submarines that are you know, it's a major buildup. This in combination with attacks on uh, Philippine fishing boats, they're claiming to have sovereignty over the entire China Sea, uh, including encroaching on the 200-mile international territorial limit on the Philippines. There are three new ICBMs in the works in China. China is also very much developing cyber warfare capabilities that would be useful in a preemptive attack. Yeah, and drones as well. That's right. A particular concern to the Pentagon is the deployment of precision-guided DF-21 anti-ballistic missiles. Uh, so they're building a missile defense system just like uh, Russia has been doing to counter any missiles that we may have coming in. In our missile defense system, which, by the way, was the concession for China uh, in supposedly getting North Korea to back down to pull its missiles out of test launch mode out of the eastern border back to where they were, the concession was that we would stand down the extra anti-ballistic missiles that we had put up in uh, California and Alaska that would have countered any supposed test missile that had come our way. But in fact, the Americans think that we have a formidable ABM system, but that we do not. It's a very high-tech system, it's true, but it doesn't have a warhead, so it must make physical conduct contact with an incoming warhead, which is traveling at hyper speeds. Very, very difficult to do. Yeah, and in fact, yeah. in other words, half of the tests have failed. Yeah. It's a, it, I was one of the doctors that took care of people at Missile Command Defense in Colorado, and they were doing tests. And they said over and over again how it would take decades to get accurate. It's a kinetic system. It's, it's got a very low accuracy, and if you have thousands of missile warheads coming, it's going to be, as I said when I talked to the director, you'll be have 11 really deads instead of 12. That's right. Well, China's surface naval forces are expanding rapidly with deployment of several new types of warships, including the first aircraft carrier, which is in uh, testing phase. It takes three to five years to learn how to run an aircraft carrier. Uh, they did their first takeoff and landing from that aircraft carrier, the J-15 fighter. So they're a long way away from being able to, you know, challenge American supremacy in the sea. And a lot of people wonder why, with all of the new anti-ship missiles and nuclear missiles specifically targeting... Uh, well, we'll take this up after the break. Absolutely amazing. Basically, the only journalist that's dealing with this real issue is the challenge of China and Russia. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, Joel, I guess we're going to revisit uh, China and more. Uh, let's continue, please. Okay. Um, actually, I, uh, you know, I have covered in general the, the fact that our government continues, even after all these reports, to downplay the Russian threat, saying it, you know, not a threat. Russia, of course, depends, I mean, China depends on uh, the United States' uh, trade in order to continue to build militarily. But the reason they're building military, and it's amazing how many people who trade with China think how they could never attack the United States. They'd be, you know, shooting the, uh, uh, the goose that lays the golden egg for them. But it isn't true. China has a long-term strategic view. They want to actually own the market. Uh, in the United States and the West, and do that by taking over those countries. So there's no middleman that they have to pay, or the you know instead of them just manufacturing, they get to market to the rest of the world and make much more money. It's not just about money, though. The Chinese have always wanted and felt themselves superior to the West, and just, and trying to take down the West. Uh, Russia also has this superiority complex, and I think it's unconscionable that the Pentagon doesn't put out a similar threat paper on Russian nuclear forces, which are ahead of China in both number and quality. Once again, let me emphasize what is gained to be by the government by downplaying the threat of Russia and China. Well, it keeps the American public ignorant of the real threats 
by not alerting us to the future danger, make sure Americans don't demand a change in our military posture and strategy or prepare themselves for a nuclear war that the government knows is coming and is preparing for. That's right. one of the reasons, besides putting out the World Affairs Brief, I put out three major books in my other career in life as a high security architect and preparedness expert. And so those books are on my website, joelscousen.com, everything from strategic relocation to high security remodeling of your uh, current homes and the building of, of uh, safe rooms. In another story yeah, that I covered last week, you know, the, um, Adam Kokesh but, uh, those is talking books are about excellent. Arm. Yeah, those are, those books are excellent. I tell people, you've got to get these books if you want to get prepared. And a lot of people say, "Well, I can't do that." I said, "Well, when that day comes, if you're not prepared, be prepared to meet your maker." Yeah, or flee with a mass of humanity. You'd be on the roads, uh, yeah, hungry insane, and starving, and at the yeah. you know. It's just, you know, a lot of people complain when I talk about street, well, I can't leave because of my job, and that may well be true, but I still believe we have eight to ten years before this happens, and that means you ought to be diligent preparing to change jobs, move out, because someday when those nuclear weapons start to fall on San Diego, where you are, Bill, and, yeah. and San Diego, you can't be there if you expect... No, I know that. I'm, I'm well aware. Now, you know, minor crises, power outages, other things, but when the, the, and the evidence signs are going to be there. In plenty of time, you're, yes, I need to start preparing right. in advance to have a secure place. At least, I, I usually call it the one tank rule. You have to have at least a gas tank away from a major population center with a community of people that are prepared to protect each other, provide each other, have skill sets from farming to machining to medical, and you have to be prepared. Or literally, a village. If you don't have that, a watch, and uh, you don't have everything prepared in advance, you're not going to make it. You know, you, as, as it says in Doomsday Preppers, you have 11 months of initial survival. You have seven months. When they say initial survival, that's probably a harder endpoint than people want to accept because they don't realize that at some future down the road, things could get catastrophic enough. They're only going to have 11 months if they don't prepare properly. Even if they yeah, were partially prepared. You know, it's, it's one of those things that even in nuclear war, most people do survive. Half of the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki survived. Sure they do. Uh, they, even even and, down near Ground Zero, to being on the other side of a pillar. Uh, it's remarkable right. how people can survive with simple things like a, a safe room or a bomb shelter or even just being around the other side of a hill. That's right. And so what I'm saying is people do survive, but they do get sick. They do have problems. They do face starvation. They do face pillaging. And you just don't want to put yourself in one of those situations. As hard as it may be to relocate or to change jobs or do other things like that, it's infinitely easier than trying to make your way out of clogged freeways in Southern yeah, California to try to reach a safer area. It's, I you tell know, people I'm don't an even expert think in the area. When I look at the maps of how you get out of San Diego County, and you look at all the massive areas of population and deserts that surround you, and the few roads that there are, <laughs> the few paved <laughs> roads it's that insane. there are, I mean, there's only five ways out of the L.A. Basin with 20 million people, five major highways. Yeah, yeah. And the rest, you're, if the you're rest not on already, you're not going the, anywhere. Yeah. You're, you're hunkered down and waiting for Armageddon is what I, I say. <laughs> yeah, but you know, and that is a viable strategy if you do have concealed safe rooms and you have a year's supply of food and you're willing to stay out of the way and uh, and you know, it's not as good as relocating beforehand and that's one of the purposes that my world affairs brief has. But it, but it's doable form, if you have enough almost, like-minded people around you and you actually have a strategy. Yeah, and you've got to get some advance warning if you're going to stay mm -hmm. in an unsafe area. And that's one of the purposes of my World Affairs Brief Search is one of those foremost analysts watching for this war situation. I am going to be putting out alerts when I see it coming closer. It is not imminent. I'm not saying that war is around the corner. You do have time, and yeah. there isn't a sense of panic. And I've said many times, too, you know, this whole talk about the collapse of the dollar and the collapse of the euro, the powers that be are not going to let those collapse mm -hmm. yet. You cannot no. switch to a world currency without a new world order, and it's going to take war to get there. In yeah. fact, they're going to keep this thing milking this, these bailouts and other things along until war comes, because then they walk away scot-free. They blame the war on the collapse. Yeah, exactly. They don't get blamed yeah. for it. Well, isn't if that historically the fact, to happen, They get all the blame. Well, it, it, what you've done is not look at what we call what it looks like to your face. You've looked at historically what's going on, which is why your newsletter is so different than anybody else. Historically, this is what they do, what the globalists do. 
They walk away after a war, which is the best social engineering tool of change, and then they say, hey, we can blame it all on the war. The debt's gone. We've got a whole new system now. That's right, and they've got every excuse, and everybody's crying for deliverance from the government. They'll believe anything the government says. So exactly. it's the perfect solution, and I, that's why I think things, uh, you know, we do have time to prepare, and we ought to use it wisely. But, you yeah. know, and I was just entering into one of the other hot topics is this armed march on Washington, D.C., sponsored by Adam Kokesh, former Marine, and, you know, it's just not wise to be marching in D.C. with uh, long guns on your back and Daring them to arrest you, it would be so easy for an agent provocateur to start shooting and to create a massacre. And besides, any way you look at it, this the gun-toting society is going to get a bad name in the press from this. This is not going to help. It's certainly not going to induce yeah, anybody that, that, that. in the city council in D.C. to change the rules. They're only going to feel more justified by this kind exactly. of a tactic. So the kind of tactic that I think is to be quiet, to go to your local county sheriff, make sure you take gun training courses. Courses, go with your friends to, to the local shooting range. You don't necessarily have to join a big group. You just have to become competent. Make sure the sheriff knows where you are if he needs to call on you. If there's a disaster, get cert training. Get your BTLS and basic trauma life support, basic cardiac life support. Have an emergency kit. Volunteer fire department. Get involved with it. Uh, you know That, to me, makes sense. This idea of big marches, this is just uh, sticking your thumb out and just asking for trouble. And believe me, the government wants to have a disaster so they can justify the next stupid moves they're going to do on us. Well, you know, you're not going to change New York State. You're not going to change California. You're not going to change... No. Um, uh, you're not going to change Washington, D.C. You're not going to change Connecticut. These ones that have anti-gun laws on the board, you're never going to change it. So you might as well move out of those states instead of trying to do these marches, which only you know, work to our disadvantage on this. Go to states where the majority strengthen the states where we have proper gun rights, because frankly, I don't believe we're going to win this overall battle against this new world order. I think we're going to have pockets of resistance. And so it is important ultimately to prepare to move Move to those areas where there is majorities of people who will defend Christianity, who will defend gun rights, who will defend right. conservative values. That's the only salvation, not in trying to win against an overwhelming majority of ignorant and corrupt people that are in the big urban areas of this world. Right. Well, look at Oklahoma. I mean, how many laws did they pass that basically said, go to hell, federal government. We're going to have gun rights. We're going to have a single language. We're going to have single English-only signs, and we're going to deport people that are illegally here that haven't decided to just go get a uh, green card so they get properly go through the process of becoming a citizen. I mean, what could be more logical? Oklahoma is just setting the stage, and there's many other states like Oklahoma that basically say, we're not going to do this foolishness. We're going to do what makes common sense. That's right. Well, next week we're going to talk about that immigration bill. There's a lot of fine print in that language, especially about uh, biometric uh, identification oh, yeah, uh, required on that and uh, a lot of loss of liberty. We're going to talk about the New Orleans shooting. Here we've got another false flag operation starting, and I'm afraid we're going to get one a month now until we get gun Boy. control. They're just going to keep throwing them at us. Yeah, this immigration bill, by the way, is a sleeper. They don't want this biometrics just on the so-called immigrants and everybody and all their relatives. This is designed to be an entry point for biometrics for all Americans, which they kicked down the road two years, which was supposed to be implemented this May. So, amazing. We need to get you back on soon, Joel, for your next analysis. Uh, get the newsletter, World Affairs Brief. Get these books, worldaffairsbrief.com. Remarkable analysis by Joel Skows, and I consider the top newsletter in the world. If you want to know what's really going on and behind the scenes. Thank you, Joel. We'll be back tomorrow. Carly Schlanger coming up, and major analysis uh, as well. 